there, and welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. Over three decades have passed since the end of the American war here in mm -hmm. Vietnam, but the resounding victory of the Vietnamese people very much still lingers in the hearts of peace lovers throughout the world. In the struggle for peace, independence, and reunification, Vietnam has won the wholehearted support of friends from all parts of the world in different continents through various ways and means. Now, in Talk Vietnam today, we're very lucky to have some of those international friends here with us to talk about how their lives and work has been connected to Vietnam. Now, let me extend the warmest welcome to our first distinguished guest, former Prime Minister of Japan, Mr. Tomichi Murayama. Tomichi Murayama, born on March 3, 1924, was the 81st Prime Minister of Japan. He was the head of the Japan Socialist Party. He was elected three times. The former Japanese Prime Minister has made a great contribution to the friendly and cooperative relations between Vietnam and Japan. During Vietnam's struggle for independence and freedom, Murayama staged many demonstrations and mobilized Japanese people to protest against the American war happening in Vietnam. Tomichi Murayama has many memories of Vietnam. He founded the Japan-Vietnam Council for Peace and Friendship, or JVPF, which is dedicated to assisting the poor, people living with disabilities, as well as victims of Asian orange dioxin in Vietnam. Mr. Murayama received the Friendship Order of the Vietnamese government in recognition of his contribution to promoting relations between Vietnam and Japan. Thank you very much, sir. It is a great honor to have you uh, with VTV here today. Can I just start off by asking, what is the main purpose of your trip this time to Vietnam? Hello. I visited Vietnam this time to attend this celebration of the 35th anniversary of its national reunification. So you are here for uh, the 35th anniversary of Vietnam's reunification day. It's a very big event. What does this event mean to you? I had planned for this visit a long time ago. I do want to visit Vietnam on these special occasions because I'm so anxious to learn how Vietnam has developed over the years. So, um, you have been a long supporter of, uh, of Vietnam from during the war until the present day, as we said. Could you tell us a little bit about your connection with Vietnam? In 1994, I became Japan's Prime Minister. I was the first Japanese Prime Minister to visit Vietnam. I paid special attention to Japan-Vietnam relations, especially how to develop these ties. At that time, I chose to have both countries boost friendly relations. You could say that you were one of the first people who kind of set the stepping stone for the relationship between Vietnam and Japan. Uh, now, as the leader of the Japanese Socialist Party in Oita province, what did you do um, to help the Vietnamese people in their struggle for independence? On October the 21st, 1966, at the National Convention Center of the Japanese Trade Union Confederation, the Confederation launched a demonstration against the war in Vietnam, calling for laborers around the world to stand up and protest the war. That was the first time the Japanese Trade Union Confederation called for an anti-war demonstration on a national scale. Since then, we have taken October the 21st as the anti-war day. This day every year, we organize demonstrations. I myself try to warm up an anti-war atmosphere across my country. I organize many activities in the working environment of the laborers to protest the war anytime, anywhere. Um, so you said you visited Vietnam in 1994 as uh, the first Prime Minister. Was this your first time in Vietnam and what impressed you the most? Vietnam underwent a long war to gain peace. When I saw Vietnamese farmers in the fields or Jews full of vitality, I could feel so deeply that you are really at peace and in the course of national construction. I realized that Vietnamese people are very industrious and right away. 
I believed that Vietnam would develop strongly later on. Seeing motorbikes running on the streets, I can feel the strong vitality of Vietnam. Since you've first been here in 1994 as the Prime Minister, uh, there obviously have been a lot of changes in the relationship between Japan and Vietnam. What are some of the changes that have occurred? First of all, that is exchange between the two peoples. Most typically, the high-ranking meetings and enhanced economic cooperation. Our two countries have conducted exchanges in various fields. This shows that we have held many inspiration for Vietnam and the country has proven itself to fulfill all those aspirations. We can feel this through the current ties between Vietnam and Japan. The bilateral cooperation for mutual development has also helped maintain peace and stability in Asia as a whole. Now, Mr. Tomichi Murayama has not only set the stepping stone for the relationship between Vietnam and Japan, he has also paved the way for many Japanese enterprises to invest in Vietnam. Now, currently, the former Japanese Prime Minister has also been very active in helping children here in Vietnam who are living with the effects of Agent Orange. Let's have a look at that. With his heartfelt affection for Vietnam, former Japanese Prime Minister Murayama has founded the Japan-Vietnam Council for Peace and Friendship, JVPF, to offer help to Vietnam. As the council's president, he has directed fundraising events for Vietnamese Asian Orange victims. With the fund, he has helped to sponsor the construction of a functional rehab center for children living with Asian Orange effects and a vocational training center for the disabled in the northern province of Taiping. The JVPF has also granted scholarships to students born into poor families of ethnic minorities, but who are still overcoming these difficulties to excel in their studies. The project has gone underway in the cities of Hanoi, and also Phu Tho and Guangxi, and soon will also take place in Ningbing. As part of its activities, the JVPF has hosted many other friendship exchanges with Vietnam on various fields including economic development, culture, arts and charitable events. Every year with the assistance from the JVPF, many Vietnamese traditional art troops conduct performing tours in provinces and cities throughout Japan. With the prestige of a veteran statesman, Former Japanese Prime Minister Murayama has always supported and held close to his heart the efforts made by leaders of both countries in lifting Japan-Vietnam relations to new heights. Now, could you tell us about the main focus of the Japan-Vietnam Council for Peace and Friendship? At first, we also conducted assistance activities for victims of Agent Orange. We helped them with functional rehabilitation and vocational training, as well as generated stable jobs for them. Visiting the families of the Agent Orange victims, I was really shocked to see all the hardship they have to face. Um, now, with the Council still very much in its activities, what are some of the upcoming um, events that uh, the, the organization, the Council, has plans for uh, in Vietnam? We try to ensure that the Agent Orange victims have the opportunity to be all that they can be. After they undergo functional rehabilitation, we'll help them to get a stable job because only then can they secure their own life. Continuing with your council in uh, the upcoming, the near future now, what are some of the priorities in terms of uh, the development of that council here in Vietnam? We plan to focus on not only Agent Orange victims, but also other needy people. We grant scholarships to students of ethnic minorities and also try to enhance cultural exchanges. Recently, we invited an art troupe to perform traditional musical instruments in Japan. 
Activities like these have tightened relations, and we intend to focus more on these activities in the future. So in terms of the scope of the activities of your organization, it's not only in helping Asian Orange victims, it's also expanding into different areas such as cultural exchanges with Vietnam and also helping uh, people like ethnic minorities. Um, now, your position as the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister of Japan, um, who has gained a great love from the Vietnamese people, what do you think about the trend in the development in the bilateral relations between Vietnam and Japan, how do you think it will go forward? I consider the Vietnam-Japan bilateral relations very important, and we need to boost cooperation in economy, politics, culture, physical training, and sports. Multifaceted cooperation is very significant. I hope to make certain contributions to those cooperative activities. I think that Japanese and Vietnamese people look alike, and we both had the tradition of using chopsticks at meals. These are but few of our similarities. We are very close to each other. I hope the two countries will further cooperate to make these bilateral ties even better in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Murayama, for your contribution uh, to the development of Vietnam and the development of the relationship between Vietnam and Japan. We wish you the very best of success, health, and may you always be respected by people, not only in Vietnam, but also throughout the world. Um, we thank you again for being here at VTV. It's a great honor to have you. Now, in the second part of the show, we'll get to meet more great friends of Vietnam, two of them. Um, first is Johan Pinberg, who is the president of the Swedish Committee for Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And second is Lieutenant General Bots Laszlo, the president of the Vietnam-Hungary Friendship Association, who himself came to Vietnam during the war, during the American war here in Vietnam, to help with the struggle of the Vietnamese people for independence. Lieutenant General Bots Laszlo and Johan Pinberg are in Vietnam to join the country's celebration of the 35th anniversary of the liberation of southern Vietnam. They are among many international friends from 20 countries, which provided assistance to the Vietnamese people in the past struggle for independence and freedom. Laszlo first came to Vietnam in 1973 in the International Commission for Control and Supervision of the Paris Agreement. For him, this visit has held many surprises, unveiling all the changes Vietnam has gone through in the past 35 years of peace. To return back today, you know, after 35 years, uh, it is quite enthusiastic even for us, you know, because what we have done, what we during that time helped the Vietnamese people to, to join, to, to join the two parts of Vietnam, you know. In this case, I can see that uh, it was not in vain what we have done during that time. As for Johan Pinberg, this is his tenth time visiting Vietnam. He first came to the country in 1972 as the president of the Swedish Committee for Solidarity with Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. In Vietnam this time, he's taken aback by the fast development of Vietnam's economy. For him, this occasion is of great significance to pay tribute to those who laid down their lives for the cause of national liberation. That this visit is to commemorate the people who are no longer with us, to commemorate their um, heroic struggle and also rejoice with the present people here uh, and to look back what happened at the time and to look for the future. I think the future is always more important than the past. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. Um, now, I know that you're here in, on the occasion of the 35th anniversary of uh, Vietnam's Reunification Day. What does this event um, have, how, what is the significance of this event for you? For me, I would say, and for my committee, it shows that during the time of the American War, we belonged to an international movement which was huge, which played a mobilizing role for the world opinion. And the world opinion in this issue was very important because we had friends also in the United States. And these people 
convinced their senators in the United States, their politicians, to take laws which prohibited the American president to give money for continuous war. That is very important. Right. And how about for you, Laszlo? What significance does this event mean for you? For me, it is uh, a very great honor to be here after 20, uh, 35 years again. You know, during the 60s, uh, during the 70s, uh, we watched very carefully the happenings, the war in Vietnam, and we were always very positive with the Vietnamese people, and we tried to help at that time. And today, after 35 years of liberation, to return back here to Vietnam and to see what kind of development, what kind of achievement you have made, it is a great pleasure for us, not only for me, but for all the Hungarian people. So you say that you are coming back to Vietnam. So when was the first time that you were in Vietnam? Yeah, the first time it was in 73, as I was a very young officer, a lieutenant. Uh, and at that time, I was part of this uh, International Commission for Control and Supervision, asked by uh, international uh, group, you know, to come here and to supervise the uh, ceasefire, which was uh, signed in the Paris Agreement in 73. Now, uh, how about you, Johan? I know you were in Vietnam almost at the same, at the same time, um, in 72. the same period. 72. I was here uh, as a young socialist on the invitation of the Ho Chi Minh Youth. <coughs> uh, I spent some 10 days in uh, Hanoi, in Haiphong, um, and it changed my life and my perception of the Vietnamese people completely. Great. Um, so you said it changed your perception. What was the perception before? Before um, I had the intellectual understanding of what went on. The Americans were bad. The Americans were, were, had the machinery, the technology as a developed, highly developed and sophisticated country to make war machines. And I had the intellectual understanding that, yes, the Vietnamese have heroes. You've always had, since the time of Nguyen Tran, you've had heroes, too many heroes. But coming to Hanoi, I could see the poor people, all were poor at the time, the courageous way. Everybody was working with the same ideas, working for the uh, aspirations of your people. Nobody was let aside. Um, it meant that during these times, I could see youngsters, I could see children, I could see a lot of things, all of them with difficulties but all of them with a great sign of pride and a belief in the future. Right, so before it was more of a one-sided story and then coming here you got to see the other side of the story. Yes, it changed my life actually. Right. How about you? Did it change your life, Laszlo? Uh, uh, it has been a very, very large change, you know, because before we haven't got anything about the war, you know, to know what does it mean. You know, we, we read only in papers or books or something like that. And for us, young Hungarians, it was the first time to see what does it mean war? What does it mean suffering? What does it mean fighting against human beings? And it was a big change, you know, uh, for us, for young officers. Um, I think uh, it was such a, such a feeling for us which uh, would provide us... Uh, uh, a good base to understand the nature of the war and the nature of the, the fightings, the nature of the, the fight for freedom. Now, being an officer on the front line, having access to all these images of the war, um, what are some of the images that still stick to your mind until today? Uh, as I mentioned to you, to see the war and to see those people, those Vietnamese people, with enthusiasm and with uh, uh, very courageous uh, uh, activity. They wanted to, to, to help their people. They wanted to, to preserve the peace. They wanted to, to have their independence. And they have made it uh, with, uh, with quite nothing. You know, I'm, I'm talking about technology. You know, Johan just mentioned about uh, uh, the technology of the U.S. at that time. You know, to compare the two, what the Vietnamese have had at that time, it was quite nothing. But uh, they could win because of their feelings, because of their love to the country, because of their love to the freedom. And it was a great, great, great uh, impact on us as well. Are there any interesting stories that you would like to tell us? 
from those uh, I think we have had many, many, many interesting stories. If, if they can them. say on such a way interesting, but it was, first of all, bad and, and sad things what we have seen during that time. To go to the different uh, refugee camps or to go to, to, to see the, the sites of different villages or, or towns bombed uh, to the ground, you know, it was uh, a shocking experience at that time. How about you, for uh, Johan, in your visits to these cities, you mentioned Haiphong. What are the, some of the stories that you might have to share with our audience? Um, I have this uniqueness that I found was that people, however much they are in an extremely difficult situation, uh, that they had belief in their leaders, belief in the future, and all working for the same aims and goals. I mean, I could see that, you know, if we take the, the most important maybe sentence that I ever learned about Vietnam, uh, the sentence about Ho Chi Minh saying, nothing is more precious than freedom and independence. I understood it. So what you saw in the Vietnamese people was basically the solidarity and unity of trying to get that precious freedom and independence. Um, were there any encounters that you had during that visit that still sticks with you today? Yes, many. I have difficulty of expressing myself because It's so deep. It's okay. Yes, I, think, time. I think the most important ones that I have was with the common people. With the... Being a jogger, so I went out even during the wartime. I went out jogging. I would meet uh, a Vietnamese um, woman going you know, carrying her th baskets heavily, very heavy. I tried it. I, I asked if I could try it. And this woman said to me, she thought that I was, uh, because at the time you had a lot of Soviet people there. So everybody, if they saw somebody who was a European piggish color like me, a pig, they would be Soviets, right? So they thought that I, I was Soviet. I said, no, no, no. Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. They wouldn't know what it was. But they would, because I was there, they would offer everything that they had. Time may blur the memory, but not the friendship between Vietnam and its friends. For those like Johan Pinberg, who protested against the war during his youth, his experiences connect him to Vietnam, and it is now his second home. From 1967 until the end of the war in 1975, Protests against the Vietnam War spread throughout Sweden and shocked the U.S. administration. Former Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palmer mobilized many Swedish people to take to the street to protest against the war. The B-52 bombing in Vietnam and to celebrate the victory of the Vietnamese people on May 1st of 1973. He condemned the B-52 bombing in Vietnam which he called the torture of a nation. Thế cho nên là từ thủ tướng cho đến người dân người ta đều nói rằng là khi cuộc chiến tranh ở Việt Nam và phong trào của Việt Nam của thanh niên thụy điển ấy đã làm thay đổi cái chính sách của thụy điển chính là vì như thế. 35 years after the war, Vietnam has changed dramatically in the eyes of those like Johan. The only thing that has never changed is the love and gratitude Vietnam gives to friends like him. Now back to you, Laszlo. Um, you mentioned a lot about the struggle of the Vietnamese people and the quality of them sticking together and having this ultimate courage to fight against the Americans who obviously had a lot more than they did. So what other qualities do you see in the Vietnamese people that you especially admired? You know, during my time, uh, I've had a chance to visit different places. Uh, first uh, couple of months I spent in Pleiku. Uh, it was a 
very small city at that time, and they suffered a lot. And it was quite interesting to see the people. Uh, they, they have had a very bad feeling about the war because the situation was very bad for them. You know, it was not so easy to survive. Um, but at the same time, I have spent some time in the jungle as well, in Ben Hat or in Buko, which have been before two small villages. But during that time, it was nothing to see from the villages, you know, because it was just destroyed everything. But during that time, I've met uh, people from the armed forces, from the liberation forces. And, uh, you know, it was quite interesting for me and quite shocking for me to see and to hear that they spent already 20 years or more than 20 years in the jungle fighting. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have had nothing else, just fighting, just being in the group of, of, uh, of their colleagues, you know, their militaries, and uh, to fight for the everyday life, you know, and to, to, to achieve a kind of freedom. And they have had this kind of feeling. That, and this was very enthusiastic and very, very interesting for us to see that kind of very deep feeling for freedom. So talking about back in the days of the war, we have um, a picture here of, uh, I believe it's the Hungarian soldiers with yeah. other Vietnamese soldiers. Can you tell us a little bit more about this photo? Yeah, uh, it is a picture we have made as uh, the first time we have met uh, the Liberation Front Army uh, militaries. And uh, we have been together, you know, with the Hungarian forces, the Hungarian group of, of, of militaries. Uh, at that time, we have had 290 uh, Hungarians uh, in Vietnam, in South Vietnam, and in different places, in different districts. And uh, we have had team sites, and uh, uh, the people, the Hungarians, were with the other uh, three nations together with the job to, to control the ceasefire. And this is just uh, uh, the first meeting with, uh, with the Vietnamese colleagues. Uh, later on, we have had a very good contact with them. Wow. And it just shows uh, with, the, with the flag that uh, we are friends and we are sticking together, you know, and we are fighting together. Now, after the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1973, the International Control Commission was replaced, uh, the ICC was replaced by the International Commission and uh, of control and supervision, which is the ICCS. Uh, now, Hungary was one of the four countries um, on the commissions. Many years have passed, but this could not dull the memories of the Hungarian friends joining this group. So let's have a look at that. The Hungarian officers couldn't hide their emotions upon their visit to Vietnam. Lieutenant General Laszlo Botz, now president of the Hungary-Vietnam Friendship Association, recalled his memories of the days he spent with his ICCS fellow men in Pleiku. For most Hungarian officers, it was the first overseas trip to undertake an important international mission in Vietnam. Laszlo Botz was very proud to talk about the expertise of the Hungarian ICCS team, who was the most outstanding in Hungary's army to be chosen for this mission given the good English skills of its members. Most Hungarian servicemen, after returning to their home country, joined the Hungary-Vietnam Friendship Association, which was founded in 1989. With a great love for Vietnam, the association has been very active in boosting the friendship and cooperative relations between the two nations. The representatives of the Hungary-Vietnam Association were awarded the Friendship Mementos from the Vietnam Union of Friendship Association. So after the peace accords were signed, did the International Commission of Control and Supervision have any challenges in carrying out the agreement? Uh, it was not so easy, you know, because uh, uh, the agreement has had some parts uh, which made uh, very strict uh, rules for how to conduct uh, different activities there. And uh, at that time, not only we, I mean the International Commission, has had a, a job to do, but uh, there exists in the first time a four-party GMC, we called the Joint Military Commission, mm -hmm. uh, or the Military Committee. The four parties, you know, of the war were taking it. And uh, they have had the primary job to control the violations of the ceasefire. Wow. 
right. and uh, the Paris Agreement says if they cannot agree about that, mm -hmm. they can advise the International Commission to do uh, the, the inquiries and uh, to, to try to find uh, a solution. And in this case, I have to tell you, it was not so easy to do anything because in the four-party GMC, there were always uh, some parties missing. Mm. You know, first of all, the PRG part uh, were not allowed to take part in some cases. You know, the situation was created in such a way they were not, not able to, to get into the place to be part of the, the, the commission. And in such a way, you know, they could not agree. They could not bring a, a, a kind of decision to ask anybody. And in this case, uh, uh, many, many times, we, the international commission, we started uh, kind of uh, uh, work, you know, to, to, to find solution, to see some violations mm -hmm. or to, to go to different places. Uh, you know, uh, maybe the most effective job that we have had, it was the change of the prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very, very important job, first of all, in the first part of our, our, our mission here. Uh, it was very, very positive and, and, and very effective. But later on, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, we have got a lot of announcing violations, first of all, from the uh, regime side, Saigon regime side. And uh, uh, even I brought a uh, brochure here. Yes, please do show us. They have, they two have years made, of uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement. They have made a, a kind of white book about mm -hmm. the violations. But if you can see... Uh, on the end of this, uh, there are some pictures. Uh, you can see and you can make some question marks. Who was violating the ceasefire in this case? You know, and, uh, you know, but they wanted to, 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 uh, to bring a lot of such kind of uh, complaints that, uh, to, to make our job much more difficult, you know, not, right. to, uh, not to be able to be right uh, and, and to, uh, to give a, a, a solution for uh, for different kind of job. You might see what, what uh, cruelties uh, we could see in different places, you know, to, to, uh, to go to villages or to see the, the ruined schools and, mm -hmm. and kindergartens and, and all that uh, uh, situation. You must be, have been very shocked then at seeing these sites. Yeah, you can, what were you your can feelings then? You can imagine, as I mentioned uh, formerly, for us it was the first time to experience mm -hmm. such a a situation such a war you know we militaries uh, we came to to be to aware of uh, of of the fact what can we do or what men can do with weapons you know what kind of damages what kind of suffering uh, you can do with uh, uh, with the weapons and that's why you know for us it was a, a big experience and a big learning you know that you have to be careful using the weapons what for you use it is very important now, going back to the war happening in Vietnam, we talked a lot about what was happening in Vietnam. Uh, but now back in your country, in Sweden, what was the reaction of the people in general towards the, Vien uh, the American war in Vietnam? I think that originally, because this was the first what we call televised war, so uh, through the American television, at the time, we could see exactly what happened in the South. And by the televised war, so the war was brought into every family who had a television. And so this meant that we were quite well informed uh, and saw what happened. Now later you can say the Americans has learned a little bit. Mr. Bush has learned. Nowadays he doesn't send an independent journalist. He sends embedded journalists, so they can only tell what the army wants them to be tell, told, right? But at that time, he couldn't. So we created, or there was in Sweden, uh, a strong movement against the war, uh, s starting from, let's say, the middle of the 60s. And it grew stronger and stronger at the end of the 60s. Also, perhaps not very well known to people in Vietnam is that the end of the 60s was a period when the whole of the Western world was radicalized because of the American war. So people got left-wing opinions. 
At that time, we had a prime minister, I just caught him, doesn't Olof Palme, he was one of the most outspoken ones. And uh, he took a stand which after a while meant that, uh, let's say, it, in 1972, with the Christmas bombings, he uh, equalized the American Christmas bombings to the uh, atrocities made by uh, Hitler Germany. And it made an uproar, of course, for the American side. But it meant also that it mobilized the Swedish uh, population. So it, it played an important role. I could tell you more, but I don't want to. You played the important <laughs> part, the Vietnamese. We did a bit of the international opinion. Right. So you said one of the most prominent people who kind of gotten the movement against um, the American war in Vietnam was Olaf Palmer. And he kind of changed, he, he kind of set the perception of the Swedish people in terms of the war happening here in Vietnam. Um, how so? Uh, I, I, you see, there, were, there are always, in Western world, there are a lot of different opinions, right? Mm -hmm. So, at the time, Olaf Palme, as a minister of the government, played an extremely important role. But, of course, we as a committee, we were not always satisfied with him because we wanted to go faster forward. We demanded for more uh, for Vietnam. But he played. Nobody can say anything. I'll give you one example. We had a telephone call once from the... Uh, from the uh, foreign minister of the Pope after 1972 who called us and said, what does Olaf Palme say? I mean, we got quite often telephone calls from foreign officers in different countries because in the Western world, he was kind of the leader who was going forward and so they had to not be too far away from him because that would have been seen that they are not really uh, grasping the idea of human rights. It was a question of human rights, and it was a question that the opposite side made atrocities and, and crimes against humanity, right? right? And Olaf played a very important role. Now, we've talked about Sweden. How about Hungary? What was the situation like in Hungary, and what were the people's perception um, towards uh, the American war? Now, the Hungarian people felt uh, very positively uh, about the Vietnamese people's struggle. And uh, I would give you just an example. In 72, the Hungarian youth, the youth organization, they decided to do something, you know, not only to talk, but to do something. And they collected money for working extra uh, and to earn some money. And they collected one million US dollar. Mm -hmm. And they sent it here to uh, Hanoi just to build up uh, a school for Vietnamese people. Today, this school has uh, another status already. It is a college, and they do have uh, more than 12,000 students. But even today, the college is called Vietnamese Hungarian Industrial College, you know, because of that uh, fact, you know, that the Hungarian youth, they helped them, you know, to build up this, uh, this college. And it was opened in 77. And they felt very, very positively, I, I mean the Hungarians. And not to speak about that uh, during that time we have had more uh, thousand uh, Vietnamese students learning in different schools and different uh, institutions in Hungary. And uh, you know, today you do have uh, in the leadership of the Vietnamese uh, state and the party many, many such kind of uh, people they studied at that time in Hungary. And even today they can speak very good Hungarian. So how about for Sweden, with that distance between Sweden and Vietnam? Sweden, I mean, with Olaf Palmer, mm. as you have mentioned, was a great supporter of Vietnam. How so? I, I think that, uh, yes, if I'm saying that Olaf Palmer could be directly connected to one or two things in the development cooperation and the foreign policy cooperation. First of all, Sweden was the first uh, Western country to recognize the Democratic Republic of Vietnam at the time. We were also the first uh, country in the Western capitalist world to start bilateral relations on economic side in the midst of the war. We in the committee started 
uh, earlier, of course, because we demanded more. But these are the two things that I think is important to know. And I would also say that it created an understanding whereby people would see what Vietnamese culture, history, etc. was. So, for instance, you might have heard of manifestations, demonstrations, but um, in Sweden, which could collect 100,000, 200,000 people. But at the same time, because that the people were aware of what was going on, they also had slogans like Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh and, and things like that. So it, it was people who knew what it was about and who took an active stand. Talking about these mass mobilization, um, it is said that during this period there was a generation of people in Sweden who said they were proud to be born in the Vietnam here. Can you talk a little bit about yes, that? Yes, I would, I would put it to you like this. We, call, we speak about the Vietnam uh, generation. I, I belong to that. Uh, which means that people who became engaged during that time uh, changed their conception of what the Western world was about what human rights was about. In fact, if we look at the history, uh, this is the thing that, for instance, your great leader, uh, Hu Chi Minh, had already seen and fought for at the Paris conference. And in, 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 but this became obvious to millions and millions of people. Uh, so it changed the people uh, to give you an example, which I think is important for you to understand, which played a decisive role outside of Vietnam, was when the student, university students at the Kent University uh, made a demonstration and the American police killed two of them. It was the Vietnam War. And with the close sentiments that uh, the Hungarian as well as the Swedish people have for Vietnam, I know in Sweden there is a song, uh, the lyrics say, Vietnam is close to us like windows in a house. I think it's a very touching mm. um, lyric. Would you happen to be able to share a bit of that song with us? Um, I'm a poor singer. <laughs> okay. uh, Maybe more of the lyrics. Uh, the, the lyrics, yes, they go, it, it goes right. It's a beautiful song. Absolutely. It goes something like this, uh, if I hum it to you, okay? Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry if I hum it the wrong way. <laughs> it goes something like this. La, 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 Vietnam, la, 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 Vietnam är nära, utanför ditt fönster Blåser vinden, rök ifrån Haifong Vietnam är nära, nära som ett löfte Om att förtryckarna ska störtas från sin tron en gång Om att förtryckarna ska störtas från sin tron en gång Vietnam är nära, nära som ett löfte Att efter natten brinner dagen fram Och marken skälver under vita huset När stormen stiger till orkan långt borta i Vietnam När stormen stiger till orkan Vietnam 